So uh, street children and safeguarding their rights. So the question is why are there children on the streets? And uh, we're saying it's not really, there's no, there isn't one simple reason for it, but it's actually a very complicated one because each child has a personal history. And uh, what we do is to find out also how they relate their, their relationship with the street. So we have to find out their profile and then find out the reason why they're there. And a lot of times they would say, in our experience at least, because of child abuses, all forms, sexual, and because our organization actually do not handle sexual abuse cases, what we would do is to refer them to uh, an organization that is uh, you know, into the uh, protection of uh, children who have been uh, at least uh, what we call uh, gone through child abuses. But we have a lot of cases where the street kids are, you know, they come from uh, families, broken families. Either the, the mother got married to another one and the child is left with a grandmother or with a grandfather or to a neighbor. So the breakdown of family and then also lack of alternatives or options for productive work. Because they say that, you know, when they leave, they have nothing much to do. You know? That's why uh, what we would do also is to come up with activities for them so that they're, you know, because they're full of energies and it's very important that we need to direct them to the proper uh, route that they're supposed to take, right? Like education or recreation or learning skills and crafts. So uh, they don't have much alternatives actually. No? And because of armed conflicts, we have also have street kids who come from uh, conflict situations and somewhere, somehow, they find their way here in the cities. By the way, in my organization, we operate along EDSA, so that's from uh, Shaw Boulevard all the way up to SM North. And we also have uh, community-based children in uh, Welfare bill, bill, Barangay Welfare Bill and Barangay Addition Hills in Mandaluyo. Because while essentially our organization is street-based, we go to the children, we have uh, short, short stories and, I mean, uh, storytelling and uh, sharing of experiences. We go, for example, in uh, Araneta commercial centers. So what we also want to do is to go to the communities because there are a lot of high-risk children. Okay, so it's, a, it's a multiple factors. And uh, we said that there are two types of uh, child at risk. Because uh, under RA 7610, when you say child at risk, these are vulnerable to and at risk of committing criminal offenses. And when we speak of street children, they are, most of them are under number one. And the second one is children in conflict with the law. One who is alleged as, accused of, and adjudged as having committed an offense under Philippine law. And when we speak of street children, you know, they're so prone to committing criminal offenses. In fact, many of our street kids are, you know, they've engaged in petty thievery and even drugs. And of course, the rugby boys, we have that. No? So uh, if you look at it, uh, they're both in number one and number two, although actually for street children under the law, they come under what we call child at risk. Okay, so uh, we have abused children. Okay, so those are some of our children who go to streets and they are sexually or economically abused, abandoned or neglected because by definition under RA 7610, uh, physical neglect or abandonment is considered also well within the definition of child abuse. Now, uh, like we said, coming from dysfunctional or broken family or without parent or guardian, and a lot of our street kids are, you know, from dysfunctional families or broken families. They feel they are not loved or that they feel that they were abandoned and if you see the profile, a lot of them actually, uh, their parents have abandoned them. Or at least one of the parents have abandoned them. 
like uh, we have for example uh, a kid before in uh, crossing you know show boulevard and um, his name is the ghoul he's nine years old and uh, he comes from a family of uh, eight children and the wa and, and the mother is just a, a police aide you know a metro aide a metro aide and the father is a tricycle driver and that tricycle driver left the mother and now is living in with another woman and he's just like He's just a tricycle driver. And the ghoul is, you know, somewhere there in uh, crossing. And if you ask him, uh, why are you here? He said, well, because we don't have much food to eat at home. They're six years old and the youngest is six months. And just imagine the mother is just a metro aide earning like, I think, less than 5,000. Okay. And the, their house is like, you know, the, the comfort, I mean, I mean uh, you call it, how do you call it? the staff dressing room locker it's at uh, the locker room it's so small like if I were to tell you it's almost like here and this one if you go to their house and then uh, it's made of the ground there's no flooring and then some of our social workers were asking us where did they do those eight children <laughs> you know and then I could understand why the ghoul is in Mega Mall. Because probably he has food to eat and, you know, and he could see all of those uh, beautiful uh, display rooms and could imagine and, you know, so we said, and he could sleep on the ground. At least it's cemented, unlike their, their place. So you could understand, no? So, um, okay, so abandoned or neglected children, they come from dysfunctional uh, families and your brother Nidagul is only like six months old. So he said, who's going to take care? And the eldest was 16 years old. So he had to leave school just to take care of the, the youngest, six months old. No? And out of school youth, so we have many in, um, because we are not only into this curative, or but we also want the preventive approach. So we go to the community in Barangay Highway Hills and Barangay Welfareville in Mandaluyong City. So we have uh, children there. Some of them are out of school youth, but uh, some of them are vendors. And by definition, they are still considered street children because uh, they are children on the streets. Okay, and we have a separate category, street child. But actually, if you look at the profile of the street child, they all fall within any or all of this one. Some are members of uh, a gang. And then living in community with high level of criminality or drug abuse because our street kids, some of them, who are at least uh, working child, mga vendors, they live in informal settlers. And uh, they live in situations of armed conflicts, but there are only like, we only have two actually, who came from uh, an armed conflict situation. So, uh, so the question is, who ends up the loser? Actually, one, of course, obviously the children themselves because they are denied of their basic human rights. And uh, the most obvious there is the parental care and uh, assistance and guidance of their parents, food, shelter, health, education, clean, and safe environment. Uh, for the street kids, especially the children of the, of the street, they have some kind of an alternative family there, the older ones, and then uh, they also have still this very strong sense of sharing. So that if you give them food, they will not eat all of these foods because they would say, I'm going to bring this to some of my friends. But those who are in, the fa in communities, the poor communities, if we give them, for example, uh, food for lunch, they're not going to eat all of that because they said, I'm going to bring this home to my parents. Okay? So, we, and so we would say, no, you just eat. We will give you again because we still have some extra here. So that's what we tell them. But, and education, of course, not that, uh, 
but if you ask them in these short storytellings, they would say, uh, what would you like to be when you grow up? Some of them would say, I would like to be a doctor. But it's very difficult to impose like and tell them, you know, uh, for you to become a doctor, you have to go to school, you have to go back to your homes, etc. Because it's like imposing your views on them. We want them to own up to the responsibility. So all we do is we ask them question and answer. And we said, okay, so if you'd like to become a doctor, what do you think should you do? And then sometimes they would say, of course, I have to go to school. Yes, to go to school. And do you think you could study if you are here? Yes, I could study. Sometimes they would tell you that. But actually, probably after a while, maybe they try to process it because that's what we would like to do, clarifying their values without having to tell them, you know what, you have to go back to school. No. Uh, and there are those who would realize later on that, yes, I would like to go back to school. And then they would tell us, I want to go back to school and go to a, you know, a halfway house or a rehabilitation center. We don't take them there immediately because we would also like to know if they really want to go. And so we would say, okay, I'll come back on Friday. 10 o'clock, we'll see each other there in Jollibee. And so at 10 o'clock Friday, we will go there. And if that kid is there waiting for you, then that means that that child is prepared. And so we bring them to uh, uh, either a halfway house or some of those uh, uh, children's uh, temporary shelter. Okay, so the children themselves, because they are exposed to criminality and other illegal activities. Under RA 7610, the penalty of prison correctional in its medium period to reclusion perpetua, reclusion perpetua is life. Okay, so prison uh, correctional can be six months and one day. So the range is, but uh, this is for those it will be imposed on any person who uses, coerce, force, or intimidate a street child or any other child to beg or use begging as a living, okay? act as conduit or middle person in drug trafficking or pushing or conduct other illegal activities. And you know, as you can see, there have been a lot of young people getting killed and some were saying, oh, he's into drugs and he's a runner, et cetera, et cetera. And so they're so prone to this if not petitivity, but you know, some of our students who go on, um, what you call this, on um, exposure trips, we always advise them, you know, if you talk to them, you know, listen to them, that's the most important thing, and just ask, ask questions, ask questions. Don't moralize. And uh, you know, it's so easy to say, do you know that what you're doing is bad, you know? engaging in thievery, I mean, it's useless. Because at the end of the day, they've had all kinds of, you know, adults telling them that. But you see, they are, you know, only concerned about survival. They want to eat, right? And so uh, it's useless to say that is bad. Don't you think that you're going to hell and stuff like that? So <laughs> it's pointless and it's not even uh, good because if the moment you do that, they'll clump. They're not going to tell their stories anymore. They're not going to trust you. And we always tell them that you have to go down to their level and learn their language because they also have a different language. Because that's the only way for us to get accepted so that they will open up, so that I intervention would be easier. Okay, so also the society because uh, of the lost potential of the street children. Just imagine this. They are going to be also part of the future of our country. And they'll end up as unskilled and unemployed workers, prone to criminality, and unprepared for responsible parenthood. Because all they would do is, you know, have children, have children, and then they will again abandon them because they don't know any uh, thing about parenthood and so it's also very important that we reach out to them because they are still our future and if that's the kind of future that we have 
well, the Philippines is really not going to go far. So, so uh, and of course, there's a saying, no, by William Wordsworth, the child is the father of the man. Of course, uh, it's not very gender fair, no? <laughs> but what can we do? Okay, uh, it doesn't use a gender language, no? gender fair language. Okay, but anyway, so this is a very profound the child is the father of the man, and if we're not going to take care of them, I mean, what's going to happen to them when they become adults? Now, what can be done to help street children? You know, this, I'm, I'm just like probably rambling here. No? Maybe some would need legislation, and some we could do as non-government organizations. No? But one, I mean, two very important considerations, let the children participate in the decision-making process, acknowledge the role played by children in charting the course of their life. In the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the earlier declaration didn't talk about the right to participation. But they realized that that is very important for children. We need to hear them also because they have the right to opinion. And they also know more or less what is it that they want or probably all they need is to help us let's help them clarify their values you know, by a series of question and answer and it's very important so what do you want the ghoul and the ghoul would tell us i just want to stay here i mean so that means the ghoul is not yet prepared okay and then okay so meantime that you are here the ghoul what do you want to do well i just want some coloring books Okay, so what we do, we bring them coloring books, okay? Okay, and then visit them every now and then just to be able to know what's happening now to the goal, okay? And uh, probably along the way when their values have been clarified that, ah, so this is what I want. I want to go back to my family. Of course, we investigate also the family because if the family is abusive or they are not prepared, so the most that we can do is to give them again to the others, okay, to temporary shelters. Okay, so, uh, so it's multi-pronged strategy that would involve all of these stakeholders because to live a decent life, street children can do it alone, but together with others, they can. So what are the safeguards? I always say we participate in policy and law reform by engaging in legislative, whether it's local or national, and policy advocacy. So uh, let our voice be heard in a concerted way, particularly on legislative initiatives, you know, like they say they will have to increase the criminal liability. Now they're saying we need to uh, amend again the Juvenile Justice and Welfare Act. I guess we have to have a position and we should uh, at least inform our representatives and senators. Okay, so uh, even only if it were a barangay ordinance. You know? And then strengthen linkages with Barangay Council for the Protection of Children and assist in capacity building measures for the barangay because this council is very strategic. So it's very important for them. So we undertake coord coordinative efforts or participate in their initiatives, particularly in the adoption of a comprehensive plan on delinquency pre prevention. We could probably help you know, offer our services if we are non-government organizations. Also linkages with the different NGOs involved in street children or children at risk. So coordinative linkages could be done along the lines of expertise, types of intervention, because we don't have a lot of resources. And for example, in our case, we're only into values education. Probably the other NGO could do another one. And let's coordinate, because that way, there would be no we could avoid duplication of efforts and we could conserve resources. Establish child welfare committees in places where street children usually converge or may be found both in public and private sites. They do this in India, you know, in railway stations, malls, also in parks, you know, and probably for, the, for, the, for those in private establishment, they could do this as part of their uh, uh, CRS. Uh, undertake awareness and capacity building orientation seminars or trainings in public places such as malls, schools, churches, etc. Okay, so uh, because that could lessen the incidence. No, in in Araneta Coliseum, 
Araneta Center. One of our street kids, yung mga security guards nila, they put a rugby here. Ah, so you are a rugby boy. They put, and then they cut, cut, cut. So his hair is you know, going that way. So we need to give awareness on them. In strengthen the institutional capacity of authorities tasked to implement community-based intervention and diversion under the Juvenile Justice and Welfare Act. Because you know, the social workers and the barangays, they are not really so trained about how to conduct what we would call the intervention for children exempt from criminal liability as well as diversion. Because you have to have a diversion contract. And for uh, intervention for those who are exempt, you need to do, we need to do something also in the community. It's a community-based activity, but ang nangyayari, they just release it to the family and that's it. It's not going to help. Establish linkages with Sangguni Ang Kabataan, school authorities and parents' teachers associations for the development of youth activities on delinquency prevention. So to provide children the alternatives, options, other than the street life. And uh, these are the last one, address the needs of indigent families because skills on parenting is very important, stress management and livelihood. You know, when we ask our community, what is it, how can we help you so that your children will not be you know, in the streets? And they would say, we just need a little capital. No? Nagbumbay, uh, I mean, sorry, nag, nag, we gave out loans. No? Okay, so ang sabi nila, eh, wala. No? So, nawala yung pera. Okay, so uh, incorporate the Child's Rights and the Juvenile Justice Act in the syllabus for law enforcers. Uh, we did conduct, pero this is not sustained. Establish a nationwide system of registration of missing children and family retracing. Because we do this, but it's very difficult because there's no national system for it. Establish a mechanism in schools, barangays, etc. to monitor incidents of out-of-school youth missing abandoned okay so thank you